Hello and welcome back to another session of Effective Jaru, the series where we will read Effective Java and see if we can port the items over to idiomatic Rust. Item 33, use nmap instead of ordinary uh, ordinal indexing. Um, yeah, so let's bring up the example right away. I think it's this one, item 30, 33. So we have two actually. We have the, the herb example. So there is a herb class that has a... Um, uh, built-in type, a nested type enumeration, so to speak. And well, then you just have these, and it just sets up the herbs here and sorts them in a particular way. So it's using an enum map to associate data with an enum. Okay, <laughs> let's do that. So you think, wow, you need a special map to do enumerations. I think possibly you don't, but an enum map is apparently even better suited to to deal with these kind of invariants that you would then have i don't know apparently uh, it's a specialized map that is faster and better and uh, you know that's something that you probably have often in java because it's kind of you, you don't i mean i, I don't know it looks uh, yeah it, it seems seems that it's worth it to kind of specialize it to the point where you say well this must be an enumeration so that they can use some particular enum interfaces that they are only for enumerations to to speed something up or deal with the proper hashing, assure that the the hashing is is well done, and so on. And you know, anyway, so this is basically sorting this stuff by their um, type, by the type of herb. And um, you know, I uh, the the item says, well, don't use. Um, use NMM instead of ordinary indexing. It's a very specific thing, a very specific issue, and uh, that that's something you don't even that can't even apply to Rust in any way. So I just decided to to port this example over. So we have a kind of herb. You know, in Rust you usually don't use the word type in any way because you might end up with a variable name that is a, a reserved uh, term, like type is reserved, right? If you if you print type here. Uh, if you type type there, then you will see that it's actually lighting up because it's a reserved keyword. Uh, yeah, anyway, we have this kind and then we have the, the herb that is just the, the name of the, the herb and its kind and uh, some constructor kind of thing. So we can basically build these things. And something I personally like by now is to really make everything generic. Well, not everything, but plenty of things just to make it easy to use because especially when it comes to strings um, you know you, you can have many ways um, many kinds of strings you can have um, slices and you can have heap allocated strings which are these guys so for the sake of sanity and of independence I don't use slices which are effectively borrows here but I use a heap allocated string, right? You could also do it differently, but I think that's easiest for me to implement. But I want it to be easy for the um, um, person who's using this to specify these herbs as well. So what you basically do is say, I need this type S to implement into and into uh, basically to implement into string so that you can convert this uh, name into a string. And all you have to do is then say, well, name into which will uh, either just own a string if it's a heap allocated string already, you know, it's the same thing as if you would pass ownership, which is exactly what I do, uh, or you actually convert a string slice into a then owned new heap allocated string. And that's pretty fantastic because that way you do not mask that you want to own this stuff, which is just the case, you know. I really all the time prefer um, to actually, you know, if I need ownership, I specified in the signature instead of kind of cloning or calling to own in the uh, implementation of the function itself or the method itself, right? Anyway, that's just a detail that has nothing to do with anything else. So let's see, we have, do we have a unit test where this is implemented? Yeah. So here in the unit test, you basically implement main. And it looks like a, like a bunch of code just because I actually test against the result here. So in the moment I print, you know, I can run this cargo tests. I think lib is what I would run here. So we have no, 
uh, sorry, not lib, but test called unit, right? Because I put it into an integration test and there we have the herb test says, okay. But if you want to make it fail, we can in order for us to see the print. And I would love to have a flag, maybe I have, that allows me to just uh, say that I want to, it shouldn't catch the, the standard output stuff, but right now there is no way. Okay, so here we go. As you can see, you get the same result. We just have a slightly nicer printing. Let's run this again. And the best, well, actually it's not too bad that printing, right? It's quite concise. <laughs> Whereas this one is, well, the full debug printing that basically prints you um, a nice structure here. So this would, would be much harder to read if you wouldn't do, if you would forget the hash here behind the question uh, in front of the question mark uh, anyway so we get the right result and we test for it and we can actually just have a look at how this is implemented because that's what this thing is about right so here we have um, an array of herbs and it's all you know this is as heapy as it gets I mean you have to heap locate everything here and uh, I think this uh, array is probably heap allocated too just knows how many items there are in there. And um, well, then we set up our data structures, right? So we have an enum map that, how's that actually, how, how does that work? Let's let's have a look. We have an enum map that maps from the herb type to a set of herbs. So the set of herbs is for deduplication, I guess. And here the standard two hash seems to be used and seems to be working. Uh, to our hash code implementation seems to be just working. Interesting. Um, then, apparently the enum map requires in, in its constructor, that's really weird, that is actually indented like this. It is made like that. Anyway, so this takes the, the, the class of the enum, I guess that's its handle to how to do its weird optimization or whatever it does. And then we set up the, the data itself. And that's, that's where the differences become apparent and that's where it becomes interesting. So for each type, um, basically this allows us to in, in, uh, iterate through these uh, constants here because that's what they are. It's like singleton, uh, singleton instances of subtypes, subclasses of this nested type enumeration. Right. Oh my God, if I would hear myself speaking, I would probably not understand anything, but I think it kind of makes sense right now. So anyway, you iterate through there and uh, then you put uh, the set that you require in an empty set, right? So you say, okay, for each type, we have an empty set that can carry herbs. And uh, then you basically just go through all the herbs that you have in your garden. Um, get the set that you have just added by type and add the herb and this is how you how you sort it okay so let's see how that is done in rust so we have a stack allocated array that's also that's also an array but it's stack allocated and it has the type uh herb and then one two three four five six right that's the type of the thing uh, of course, you don't have to specify it because it's inferred. It's, yeah, I just want to say it's interesting that you don't have to uh, specify it here, but of, of course you have to. I just looked here because I kind of am used to the ways of Rust by now and it's so much, feels so much more natural <laughs> for some reason to um, specify the type uh, somewhere later. Anyway, so this is what, what we do here. It's not heap allocated, herb new. Uh, in all the kinds of Rust code you will see, will never heap allocate it, uh, heap allocate anything. It will just produce a new thing for you and uh, return it and put it onto your stack, whatever it is, or you know, into your box if you want to heap allocate that stuff. So this is our garden. And now let's see what that is. So we have a separate scope here because herbs by type should be immutable. But we have to initialize that uh, hash map at some point, right? So we have to, we need it to be mutable at some point. And I decided to say, well, let's express that. And, you know, I, I really go through this 
added complexity here just to be able to uh, just to be show that I do not want this to be editable. I think there are other ways too, and we might explore that in a moment. So here we have herbs by tie. We create a new hash map of the right kind. So here I decided to just go ahead and make a uh, give it a type hint. So we have you know this is how it's done basically. You use Cullen Cullen and then you specify um, the the um, the type arguments that you would like to to have in that basically namespace of all the possible hash maps that that there are, and then you get an actual the actual type that has been in, or that has been generated with your um, type arguments here, kind and hash set, and then uh, we create a new item of that. It's very interesting to see this underscore here at the in the type parameter of the hash set because I say well why don't you infer it you know I have to tell it I actually tried without without that but I have to tell it that this is going to be a mapping from kind to hash set because the type inference is not kind of recursively doing it it could be inferred obviously but it can't do it let's be honest about that it can't do it if it's one level deep or something so you have to give it the first level in this case and the second level it can actually infer, which is quite nice. So we go through all the herbs in our garden, um, which gives me a herb reference in here. And then um, I can, you know, the thing is, if I want to get an entry, entries are kind of special, they can create a new entry or give you an existing one. And the, the nitty gritty detail is that if it can create a new entry, then it needs to own the key that it wants to create the entry from. And our kind here is non-copyable. Our kind is clonable, but it doesn't automatically copy, even though technically it's probably not more than than uh, 16, uh, 16 bit or something. Uh, however, because I didn't specify to be copy, I have to clone this kind of my herb just because I can't rip it out of a a shared immutable borrow, right? This is why we have to do this. If you just wanted to get the key and see if there, there is something or not, and then do kind of very a code that is similar to this, uh, then we wouldn't have to clone it. But that's just a detail, which is interesting um, to see when you get into the whole business of ownership and borrowing. So anyway, I like this. I like this kind more though. If your key is light, then this is probably what you want to do. And most of the time, keys. Well, yeah, they're at least supposed to be light, right? And if they're not, you can probably just work your way around it by doing it differently. Well, I think that's also the most efficient way to do it, but let's get back to the point. So if it's vacant, if there is nothing there yet, then we can just use this handle that we get, which is our entry E, and insert whatever we want to insert. And again, here I do not specify the type, I just say hash, hash set new, and I insert the herb. And this insert call is actually what will make the type inference engine uh, rattle and uh, it will realize that this type obviously must be a herb, right? And this is awesomeness. You ne never have to specify types usually in the common case basically where it can easily be inferred. And it, you know, it's not even that dumb considering the, the code that you have here. Uh, just that at some point we have to st specify this and yeah, this is where you have to have to show it even though technically it could realize it. Technically it could know, it could know that but it's not smart enough to realize it. Obviously if I ask for the entry here and provide it with the key, that um, obviously this must be a kind, right? It's not that smart. Maybe one day, uh, which would be totally awesome. But maybe it's okay to at some point actually say what you expect here so that programmers don't wonder what kind of hash map it is because otherwise, you honestly, you wouldn't know. And I think the implementation right now is pretty, pretty good. It's not too deep, so you can still kind of follow along. But... Um, it's also not totally dumb like Java is because Java type inference basically is non-existing. So anyway, so if there is something in there already, then I just get a mutable borrow of that um, hash map or hash set and insert the herb. So that code looks pretty similar. And this is this is how that goes. And it's really um, uh, it's really um, it's a very efficient way to doing this, just because the map implementation itself it will just be dealing with one call, right? And provides me with, with a helper object 
that deals with the actual state of the hash map. Uh, whereas, whereas otherwise, I would have to try to get the value, then realize it's not there, and then I insert it, which is, you know, I think there's more more work associated with this, just because it has to check its internal state at least twice, whereas here it can kind of do it just once and possibly cache some information in the entry um, object. So that is that. So at the end of this, once we have initialized our mutable hash map, we just return h uh, as as we all know the last statement that doesn't have a semicolon finishing it um, is ju is just the return value of the scope at hand. So this is how we would do it, right? We could probably also well if if I yeah the thing yeah the the alternative to doing this with an extra scope here would be to to have a mutable h and then uh, later say let h be h so this this mutable h can then be reassigned to an immutable uh, one and this is totally valid it's totally okay and it's you know common practice i think to do it just to downgrade the access permissions on your object however um Personally, I like to have like real short, concise variable names that are only um, descriptive in the in a narrow context. But that's something uh, you know you you can possibly expect from people to understand. Um, whereas then, when it's getting to a broader context, I would like to work with more descriptive, longer variable names. You know, this here is kind of nice to read, and it's you know to me it looks decent. Uh, whereas later we can use uh, herbs by type. So let's let's see. Then for the uh, equality tests, I think it's also interesting again because we use the the scope, the scopes that return something um, way to actually set up our our test case here. So what we do is we get our herbs by type uh, by providing it with the um, variants of our type enumeration. Of our kind herb type in a uh, herb kind enumeration, uh, and we expect it to return something, right? Because we just put something in there, so it's reasonable to expect that. But if there wasn't something in there for some reason, this would panic, right? But that's okay. The code that can panic is always associated with an unwrap, which is uh, awesome. And on the right side here, we basically build a little hash set on the fly. We just say, okay, I insert this piece of garden herb and this piece of garden herb uh, into the into the hash map uh, into the hash set and it will do the right thing why does it work because i actually insert look at this actually that's a good thing that we use type inference the type in here is herb yeah the type is not herb this is not owning the thing it's just a borrow so it's basically just a reference into my uh, stack allocated garden array and the only reason this works is that the garden outlives uh, my hash set if this wouldn't be the case the borrow checker wouldn't allow it um, but that's actually that's actually a detail but this is also why uh, this works I think that you know that we don't have to copy stuff around um, that we can actually just refer to things and you know that's as fast as it gets so uh, as a comparison, conclusion, I'd say that in Java, you probably have tons of different implementations that tweak implementations of certain interfaces that tweak stuff. Like you have a concurrent hash map, you have an enum map, and you have a um, read-only map or something, or a frozen map, I don't know, stuff that is immutable maybe after a while or once you have it frozen. But it's all determined at runtime, it's all very specific. And you could ask yourself, well, does enum map, is it threat safe or not? Probably not, because for that you need the concurrent hash map, right? Or maybe there's a concurrent enum map and the people who have to implement this, they earn good money because they, they kind of re-implement the same stuff all over again um, with little tweaks in there. You know, and Rust this is just not uh, done because by default the object itself it's just itself and it doesn't care about threadedness but it also can't be harmed by it because by default you cannot you cannot do weird things with threaded or concurrent accesses uh, or even you know uh, alias mutable access because Rust will prevent that from happening right away 
Anyway, so here we go. Uh, basically, this just verifies that this is working. And yes, it is working. Uh, that's this example here. Let's do we have time. 20 minutes. Actually, that's a good that's a good uh, length. So let's just call it a session. Thanks for watching and have a great day.